Okay, very well. So welcome to this webinar um, hosted by Marine Traffic. Uh, my name is Argiris Tassinagis, and it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome you at uh, Ships at Ports. Uh, we will discuss about reducing greenhouse gas emissions and practical measures that have been proposed by the Global Industry Alliance, um, which is operating under the auspices of the IMO. Uh, a guide has been recently uh, launched and uh, it includes recommendations. And I have the pleasure to have here with me uh, to discuss this, Astrid Dispert from the IMO. Astrid? Hello. From... <laughs> Hello. Uh, ben van Scherpzeel from the Port of Rotterdam and Chairman of the International Task Force for Port Call Optimization. Ben? Good afternoon, everybody, and happy to be here. Thank you very much for the invite. Thank you, Ben. Ricardo Ungo is from the Old Dominion University, an expert in ports and logistics, and he is at the Ports and Logistics Institute there, director. Hello. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ricardo. And uh, I have the pleasure to have two uh, panelists from the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Uh, Tanya Greskovic, who is a Principal Environmental Program Specialist. Hello, Tanya. Hi, how are you? Very Welcome. Well. Great to have you. And Rich Laraway, he's Acting General Manager. Hello, Rich. Good morning from New Jersey. Thank you. Good to have you. And indeed, good morning, good afternoon. We uh, have audience from uh, all time zones, I expect, as is usual for such kind of events. So. Welcome, dear speaker, uh, dear panelists, and uh, welcome, uh, great audience. Thank you for joining us today. Um, the first, the, the webinar will revolve with uh, Astrid giving us uh, an overview of uh, the work that has been conducted uh, as regards the ship port interface and the uh, measures that have been proposed. Uh, we will then uh, ask your opinion about them, and we will discuss it with our panelists. So. Uh, I will mute myself, and if all uh, panelists not speaking, please mute. And Astrid, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Agiris. I hope you can hear me, and uh, thank you for inviting IMO to speak and join this uh, interesting webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to present actually work we are doing in collaboration with the industry. IMO is working under the Global Industry Alliance with a lot of industry partners, including Marine Traffic and also Port of Rotterdam that are that are here today, and I'm going to try to share my screen and present. Let's hope you can all see my screen now. Excellent. Um, I'm going to present mainly work um, um, on the Global Industry Alliance to support low carbon shipping and uh, the shipboard interface guide that we have very recently published uh, from the GIA, Global Industry Alliance. But um, let me just start giving a little bit of a policy framework background. I'm sure you're all very aware of um, IMO's initial greenhouse gas strategy that uh, was adopted in 2018. I'm not going to go through, through this slide in detail, but uh, the initial greenhouse gas strategies sets out a vision and says that as a matter of urgency, we need to phase out um, emissions as soon as possible in the century from shipping. So as you can see here, there's a very clear timeline, a very clear framework that has been created. A, a huge challenge ahead, but uh, the strategy makes very clear the direction we are traveling and how emissions need to be cut. Um, I think the most important target that you can see here is the 2050 target of uh, at least a 50% reduction in total annual GHG emissions to be achieved uh, by 2050 compared to the 2008 baseline. Uh, the strategy, if you look at it, includes measures, short-term measures, mid-term measures, long-term measures um, to support, obviously, achieving those targets. And IMO is, at the moment, working on developing those measures further to enable us to achieve these targets. And maybe you are aware, just last week, there was a big meeting of the Marine Environment Protection Committee, the MEPC, that actually adopted the first set of mandatory um, amendments to MARPOL Annex 6 to uh, mandate improvements in the operational efficiency of shipping. 
The strategy also makes reference to ports and the importance that ports have to play in decarbonizing the maritime sector. There is a short-term candidate measure included in the strategy that refers to ports. And IMO has also adopted the resolution on ports, this resolution 32374, that really tries to encourage the cooperation between ports and shipping. And if you look at this resolution, it includes different areas of action that the port could take to support emission reductions, um, such as the provision of onshore power supply, um, the provision of bunkering for alternative and zero carbon fuels, which we know will be very important to achieving the emission reduction targets, as well as providing incentives for sustainable low carbon shipping and uh, actions such as optimizing the port call and our group, um, the, uh, the Global Industry Alliance, the work I'm going to be presenting today is, as you can see here, uh, an alliance of 14 different companies. It includes shipping companies, port, the Port of Rotterdam, um, data providers such as marine traffic, but also technology providers and, um, and classification societies. And we are collectively with IMO under the Green Voyage 2050 project. We are working to identifying barriers to low carbon shipping and collectively with the industry trying to come up uh, with solutions that can support the maritime sector in, in its transition to low carbon shipping. And we have very recently um, published a new guide, the Ship Port Interface Guide. Uh, I'm sure we can share a link later with, with everyone that is really there to, to provide some, some ideas of what uh, measures could be taken up in the Ship Port Interface to uh, reduce emissions and support IMO and the industry in achieving its targets. This guide has been developed uh, in, uh, by this GIA members in collaboration with a lot of subject matter experts that have provided inputs to this work. Um, I must caveat it, it's not intended to provide fully developed solutions, fully fleshed out. It's really a, a, a publication that presents initial ideas um, that require more work and require more assessment. But as you can see here, there are eight measures included in this guide, and we have selected these eight measures based on their, uh, their, their potential application at a global scale. So we think these can be um, applied today with uh, limited capital and operational investments. We think they are relatively easy and, and quick to implement and uh, have the potential to really contribute to emission reductions in the ship port interface and have additional also advantages and benefits in terms of safety and security of shipping. Um, you'll see some of these measures uh, can be implemented individually, they can be implemented collectively and that obviously would maximize the reduction impact. Um, some of these measures uh, are applicable each time that you that the ship calls a port, like obviously the SIMOPS one and the pre-clearance one, and I will go through them very briefly in a second. While other of these measures are less frequent, um, like immobilization or hull cleaning, but can have a real big impact on fuel consumption. And that's, that's why we have included this in the list. The list is definitely not exhaustive. It's just... Um, meant to serve and, and raise awareness of some of very practical, tangible ideas that uh, we have been able to identify. I must also say every port is different. So it's, it's really up to the port to have a look into this and see and every port has different challenges and different characteristics. characteristics. So it's really, we would encourage ports to, to look at these um, ideas and explore um, opportunities further for their individual ports. Um, if you look at the guide itself, it provides um, information on what the measure is and how it can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it explains also potential other advantages, as I said, on safety and security. It also includes information on the barriers. Why are these measures not actually done today? We look at this list and we feel like maybe a lot of ports are already doing this, but in reality, many are not. And what's really the reasons for it? And, and I think we try to explain that in our publication. And we provide some, some preliminary potential solution and next steps as to how this could be implemented on a global scale. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go in detail into every of these H measures, but let's just give me, uh, allow me just to give a very short overview of each, uh, because we're going to be discussing them going forward with, with you all. 
So the first one is uh, facilitating immobilization in ports. Um, as you can see today uh, in many ports, uh, maintenance and repairs of the main engines are performed at the lay by berth. So it's outside the normal ship uh, schedule. As you know, most ships only have one a main engine. So once repairs have started, the ship cannot really depart from her berth under own under own power and this condition is called immobilization and many ports currently do not uh, or many port authorities currently do not uh, allow immobilization in ports so the measure in turn is allowing uh, maintenance and repairs of main engines to occur um, and uh, simultaneously with cargo operations um, maintenance can vary a lot. It depends on obviously what maintenance you're doing to the engine if you're changing an injector or replacing a piston, but uh, we have seen that this can take between three and 24 hours, a so substantial time that uh, is added uh, to the port call if this cannot be done and simultaneously with cargo operations. What's the greenhouse gas benefit from that? Obviously, we are able to optimize the time the ship spends in ports if you can obviously do your repairs and uh, simultaneously do cargo operations. Uh, you also eliminate the need for the ship to transit to another location for this to be undertaken as it is now that often the ship needs to go to a lay by berth to do main engine um, maintenance and repairs. The second um, measure is about facilitating hull and propeller cleaning in ports. Um, many ports today do not allow a hull propeller, um, hull and propeller cleaning during the port stay. So what we are suggesting is uh, allowing hull and propeller cleaning to take place in the port and ideally simultaneously also with cargo operations. That again will optimize the time ships spend in ports, um, eliminate the need for the ship to transit to another location to undertake hull and propeller cleaning and obviously the 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 hull and propeller cleaning itself has an effect on greenhouse gases as it reduces the resistance to friction on the hull and with that um, the, uh, the fuel consumption of the ship itself so a lot of benefits from a greenhouse gas perspective the third one is uh, facilitating um, simultaneous operations simops in ports um, nowadays, many ports do not allow operations to occur sim simultaneously, so no simultaneous cargo operations, bunkering, provisioning and tank cleaning. The measure, therefore, would be to allow those operations to occur simultaneously, and uh, that, again, can optimize the time that the ship spends in port, as the operations can be concluded in parallel rather than in sequence. The fourth one is about uh, port stay, uh, optimizing the port stay by pre-clearance. Uh, pre Nowadays, we have operational delays on arrival uh, during port operation and departure due to clearance, uh, clearance processes in ports. As you know, as requirements for notifications and declarations, so ships must provide to authorities uh, certain forms for cargo and, and persons clearances and these typical clearances are provided by customs by immigration by port authority by port health um, there is additional type of clearances sometimes depending on the ship types um, related to clearance of the cargo so cargo sampling checks to ensure the quality and, uh, and this really often results in delays uh, on arrival and departure as clearances from the relevant authorities uh, have not been obtained. So the measure here is really trying to, to facilitate all required clearances in advance to really avoid um, any lost time there. We have many, in many instances, even uh, ships need to wait at anchor to get clearances. And this is really about trying to eliminate that. This again would optimize the port call stay. We will eliminate with that unnecessary waiting time and there is uh, no need to recover delays in transit. Um, number five is about uh, improved planning of ships calling at multiple berths in one port. Um, Nowadays, what we see is that uh, the port, the planning of a ship calling multiple port is very fragmented. 
and this results in really unnecessary shifting of the ship to, to between birth and, and waiting times. And uh, the situation today is that agents need to collect uh, information from a lot of different sources. And this is usually done by phone. It's very labor intensive as a huge dependence on manual follow up uh, if there is any unforeseen changes. So if you have unforeseen changes in, in port, in your port operations delivered to the ship, uh, any unforeseen changes in the terminal completion times or completion of bunker provisions or the booking of pilots and tax. Um, this is all done many times manually nowadays. And uh, that is obviously very um, inefficient. This effect is even more pronounced when we have ships that call multiple bursts, such as container feeders or chemical tankers, parcel tankers, um, as there's no real overview of, of the burst planning for multiple, um, for multiple bursts. So as a result, as we say here, planning of the ships is really fragmented, is extremely manual, and uh, we, are, we are suggesting improving improving this, this planning, which will then result in improved port turnaround times and uh, reduced bunker and bunker savings in the subsequent voyage to the next port call. Um, the number six, we are almost getting there, is about uh, improving <laughs> ship port, uh, ship burst compatibility through improved post, uh, port master data. Nowadays, what we have, the situation we have is that uh, many ports and terminals do not have easily accessible and high quality data available on the maximum ship sizes that can be accommodated. Um, also, what we have is that many ports and terminals do not really have unique identifiers for in individual bursts that are used on a global level. And this really results in, in a misunderstanding, miscommunication regarding which uh, bursts a ship should be going to. Um, and without that common understanding of uh, which uh, terminal and which burst the ship should be going to, it's really different to obtain very accurate information on the maximum length and beam uh, of a ship that a terminal can accommodate. And as a result, what we have is that the ship is not may not be optimized to the particular burst. And uh, we think that improving ma port master data, for example, by using AIS metadata can really help uh, improve that database and ensure that the, really the right ship is utilized for a particular burst. So it's really about optimizing which ship is going to, be, to which burst. Um, this can obviously improve or reduce greenhouse gas emissions because you're optimizing the utilization of the ship, the ship size for a particular burst. So reducing GHG emissions per um, carried ton of cargo. Number seven is about uh, improving and allowing better optimization of the that weight through improved master data. Here again, there is a, a lack of reliable and, and uh, up-to-date uh, information on port master data in particular regarding to depths, depths at the uh, depths at the water route, at the fairway, at the harbor basing, at the, the burst pocket. So improving this, this data and making it more accurate and more available and keeping that up to date uh, can, can support enabling optimizing draft of the ship because uh, masters do not um, need to keep big margins or, or buffers in the under keel clearance. The last uh, measure uh, in our catalog is uh, about optimizing speed um, between ports. I think uh, we have all heard quite a lot about just-in-time operations. Uh, we have a separate guide developed with this same group, the Global Industry Alliance, on just-in-time and what it is and how it can be implemented, uh, hopefully globally. Um, but it's really about um, the optimization of the, the port call and prov providing really uh, um, information and data uh, on when the ship should be at the pilot porting place uh, ahead of time and, and accurately. So we think just-in-time arrivals has uh, also great potential on emission reductions uh, because it allows to the ship to optimize its uh, speed into the port and it can greatly reduce the time that uh, ships spend outside the port uh, maneuvering or anchoring, waiting for, for their berths. I think that brings me uh, to the end uh, of my presentation and uh, thanks a lot for listening. I, I hope we... Uh, as a GIA provided you with some ideas. And uh, I think also 
hopefully we've been able to show the vast amount of opportunities that there are to implement cost-effective measures. And we call them no regret measures. Um, and uh, we hope this is gonna spur some, some thoughts. Um, one more thing, all these measures you've seen uh, as they relate to the ship port interface will require triangular collaboration. It's important to have collaboration between shipping terminals and ports. Um, to uh, port authorities to, to deliver this. I think it's also clear that no one, no stakeholder alone is able to take these uh, measures forward. So um, really the speed and, and how much we can Im Im implement those measures will really depend on, on the, the strengths of the collaboration among this, these players. And I think also the, the willingness of stakeholders to, to play a part and play a role even if they may not be the direct beneficiary of, of, of the measure itself, I think is very important. With that, uh, I hand over to Agiris. Um, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank Marine Traffic and obviously all our GIA members that are very actively working with us uh, at IMO on uh, these initiatives and ideas. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's excellent work that has been done by the group so far. So thanks a lot and over to you, Agiris. We have been impressively efficient as usual in summarizing such a, a wide content into a few minutes, each one of these measures in a way, you know, could justify its own webinar, its own discussion. Uh, but here we are to just, uh, you know, take this thinking a little bit forward. Before we continue with the discussion, now is the time to do a couple of things. One is to remind the audience that you can submit uh, your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of the, uh, of the webinar. And also that now is your time to actually say which one of these measures uh, is the most appealing to you and you feel you would like to see it prioritized at your own port or maybe you are a shipping company at the ports that you're calling at. So we'll just run a poll now. Uh, and if we can have the poll appear on our screens, please. There we go. And all we need you to do is, you know, you can select more than one uh, simply uh, click on the ones from these measures that seem to be most appealing to you and should be prioritized. Uh, you can click more than one. And once you do that, uh, simply then click on the submit button. Uh, it will stay open for a few more seconds. Let's give it another, uh, let's say, 20 seconds for you to read them through and, uh, and click on the ones that you feel are most important and should be prioritized over others. Each one of you would have your own line of work uh, to consider in this. Okay, let's give it another uh, five seconds. And... Uh, Okay, so I think it's more or less time now to close the poll. And thank you very, very much for all of you who contributed. Uh, is it possible to see the results now of the poll, please? So that's not bad. Each one of them uh, has received some attention. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, the optimization of speed between ports, which is also linked to previous discussions that we have had on just-in-time arrival, um, is the most popular option here, nearly 50%. But we also see simultaneous operations in ports, optimization port, uh, of the port poll by, uh, by pre-clearance uh, pairing very, very strongly. Uh, even the multiple uh, berths uh, in one port being there. Um, so um, that's great. Really, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear, uh, dear viewers, for, uh, for voting here. We will publish this in a blog post uh, after the webinar. Um, so let's proceed now with the discussion. And what I would uh, like to do is actually go to, you know, uh, to Tanya uh, and the port of uh, New York, New Jersey. Um, so you guys were not involved in this, uh, in this uh, work around those uh, quick wins of measures. 
What is your um, initial reaction to them as you have, have become familiar with them? Do you see uh, some value there uh, very quickly? Um, yes, I mean, we have to take a look at it. Um, I have to discuss it, you know, with, with um, various other people before we, you know, make a comment on it. Um, I think as a, as a general measure, you know, we do hear often enough shore power <laughs> as a way to reduce emissions. And we've had some experience with that. Um, we don't run it per se. Um, it's also important to note that we're like um, a landlord port so we don't necessarily um, are in charge of operations um, it's you know handled by our marine terminals there's two public berths right I mean I think Richard can speak more to that but um, you know our involvement in that sense on a lot of what goes on at birth um, is, is limited and we're also not a regulatory agency um, per se so we rely on um, federal or state government to take action and mandate certain things, but these seem very, you know, reasonable things to me, at least. Um, so I'm sure we'll, we'll there's there'll be stuff to discuss. Um, we overall like do offer incentives to reduce emissions. We are intensely focused on it. We're the first agency, public transportation agency, that um, joined the Paris Climate Accord, or you know, basically agreed to the targets set by it. Um, New York and New Jersey both have aggressive targets in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we, um, I basically manage a program that's called the Clean Vessel Incentive Program that goes into um, vessel speed reduction and, and it's, it's a scoring system and basically we um, incentivize people to slow down and to um, register with um, ESI, but that's, you know, I can, I can discuss further if people are interested. Yeah, no, uh, it's great that you actually already mentioned it. ESI, the Environmental Ship Index. Uh, what kind of incentives do you give to your uh, to, to, to vessels calling at, uh, at your port around that? Well, we give, uh, it's a scoring system. So based on an ESI score, um, they could um, potentially earn money. They can earn money based on um, vessel speed reduction um, for the last part into the harbor, um, which we extend beyond what's required by um, federal law. Um, and if, you know, depending on how many vessel calls you have, you can rack up, you know, substantial incentive payments over, um, a quarter they, usually the payments happen every quarter. So, um, our clean vessel incentive program is funded by approximately $1.5 million. Okay. That's great stuff. Um, talking about DSI, I, I think in to do, I think in Panama they also look into that and I'm looking at uh, Ricardo simply because he has experience from Panama and there was also a question in the Q&A about how all these measures potentially apply there. Um, would, you, would you like to tell us a little bit more about how a significant canals such as Panama uh, might be perceiving such kind of measures and indeed what actually drives them in their environmental agenda? Mm -hmm. Uh, sure. Um, well, basically, when we consider the, all these initiatives, uh, probably we need to always uh, go back to the drivers of all the environmental changes. And then we need to remember that the, probably the main driver of, of all is the community. And that we want all those changes uh, because the community that is nearby or nearby canals or uh, marine terminal facilities. So those are the main driver for you know, many of the changes. And for example, in my previous experience in the, in the Panama, Panama Canal, uh, you could see that the, the companies or the institutions are trying to, to extend the environmental stewardship especially for the community. And the first goal is adopt themselves the carbon neutrality as a goal. And then later on, then it comes uh, the objective of offering incentive to other companies to also to follow the same environmental guidelines. For example, in, in Panama Canal, they have a very successful program that is offering incentive this is like a real environmental reward program for uh, 
following uh, or adopting a specific uh, environmental uh, guidelines, such as the environmental ship index and so on. Well, uh, thank you, Ungo. Uh, ben, looking into, into Rotterdam, you know, leading a European port, um, how do you see uh, measures such as the ones that have been proposed uh, being, uh, being taken on board? I think that some of them are already, uh, already applied there, aren't they? Uh, Well, we are working on all of them, on all eight measures as we speak. And some of them were already started uh, a few years back because some of these measures take more time uh, to implement, such as uh, changing from a local chart datum for devs to an international chart datum, which requires a cleanup of databases. So <clears throat> uh, in a brownfield environment, as uh, the port of Rotterdam, that requires a cleanup of a legacy of data, which is time consuming. But other measures which were quickly to implement, like uh, allowing hull and propeller cleaning, together with the national authority to grant permissions to companies to uh, facilitate uh, this, that is rather quickly. That's why also these measures are on the top of the list. They are rather quick and easy. Um, so, looking at all those eight measures, um, yeah, it depends on uh, are you on the top of the list, it's already implemented, on the bottom of the list, where we are facing a legacy of data, or where we are me uh, working on a lot of uh, stakeholders, like just-in-time arrivals, yeah, that takes more time. Indeed, just in time arrival takes more time. We we know that many parties have been trying to do all sorts of initiatives, especially around data and data exchange, which can facilitate this. Uh, talking about data, uh, Rich, we've been talking about uh, about Port of New York, New Jersey, utilizing uh, data for all sorts of inno uh, innovative purposes. Would you like to get us through about your thinking, which definitely have also operational impact and uh, environmental impact? Definitely. Um, so, so from from Astrid's presentation, um, we're definitely interested in ship berth um, compatibility, um, but but maybe more specific for for a port authority like ours, we're we're really interested in in um, berth availability. So, as a port authority, as a landlord port authority, we have infrastructure responsibilities uh, um, pier side, whether that's for wharf repair, fender replacement. Or even maintenance dredging to make sure that the that the depth of, of the of the berth pier side is is maintained to the design depth. So um, what we've been able to do is we've we've been able to leverage the data that marine traffic offers to essentially understand um, uh, berth utilization uh, not only by TEU by capacity but also by draft of vessel. So therefore, as we go into a seasonal planning cycle for for maintenance dredging pier side we can then plan um, and prioritize berths based on their on their utilization and take the berths um, offline um, at, at, at the, at, I guess, within windows and timeframes that would provide the least disruption to the, to the vessels that are, that are due to call at that, at that berth, and then, and then ultimately to the marine terminals. And by doing so, we can hopefully reduce the amount of time that a vessel would spend at anchor um, waiting for a berth to be available because of, of required maintenance dredging or because of required fender repairs. So that's just one example of how we've been able to use the real-time uh, data that the marine traffic uh, does provide to, uh, to influence or to inform um, both maintenance and operations decisions here at the port. Okay, that's interesting. It kind of ties in with the various measures they're talking about, port master data and essentially ensuring that what you read on the port master data does really indeed apply in reality or vessels to operate within a safe, uh, uh, a safe context. Um, this is, uh, you know, if we were to rotate back to Tanya there, I mean, um, looking into other environmental considerations um, around the, the New York, New Jersey area, you have, haven't you applied um, speed restrictions which relate to, uh, to whales uh, and other, uh, um, 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 yes, there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a federal, yeah, there's a federal requirement 
um, that is in effect from, I think, November 1st through August and not uh, um, April. So that requires ships to slow down um, either which way during that period um, due, uh, due to the right of whale um, law that we have an effect there. And um, because slow steaming also ultimately reduces emissions as the ships enter the harbor, we offer um, to extend that incentive. So it becomes an all year round requirement, basically, if you wanna rack up enough points to um, get incentive payments, then um, it basically pays is you to slow down during the last leg. And if you do that all year round, um, you can, you know, you can successfully um, get enough credits from us for that. And do you see adoption from uh, from your clients there? There is some, some um, large container companies have been very, very successful at um, complying, you know, with a, with, a, with a speed reduction and then extending that all year round and having it you know, almost like the captains slow down on every call. So um, that, you know, it adds up and it, because the ships are registered in the environmental ship index, we are able to calculate an exact reduction of emissions. Okay, that's very interesting. I mean, uh, Ricardo, when you look into, into Panama, as we were discussing, or indeed other, other uh, similar um, uh, setups around the world, either large ports or um, or canals, uh, are such kind of measures now? Would you say widely implemented? And I think talking about again about Panama, I'm sorry. I think they they were also looking into into whale protection. Isn't that true? Recently, um, into um, yeah for uh, for the whales. Yes, in many places around the world, they are uh, trying to look at the avoidance of collision with whales, and especially trying to delimit the specific approach area, let's say for canals or for straits or BC, BC areas, and then try to uh, slow down the vessels while you have the, the well migration. So that is in, in many places, and that might be an opportunity also in the future for more integration and data sharing in the sense that the, if there is more information about the exact location of the wells than the exact location of the vessels, then we can uh, really improve uh, the collision rate. That, that is something that is a, a very good possibility in the future. You mentioned data sharing and my mind goes automatically into, into something which is discussed much more lately with essentially data sharing within port, uh, port mm -hmm. ecosystems. Uh, and I know you have experience there. Um, there are often challenges involved uh, in data sharing. What, uh, I mean, Ricardo, if you would like to say a few words about what your experience is there. Well, in the, well, when you look at the measures, uh, you will notice that the, out of all measures, many of them, they require data sharing. And that is a crucial uh, component for achieving the goal. And that brings to the forefront the concept of the digitalization of the ports or even the digital twin for the ports. Because in order to achieve that emission reduction, you need that information sharing. That can be challenging. Um, for example, uh, in some, uh, for example, in, there is a successful example of the single window initiative in Panama Canal, in which uh, the vessels were bored twice, so once for the Panama Canal and once for the um, for the authorities at the at the berth, and then that was reduced because the ability of sharing information and creating that repository for, for information and share that across the institutions. However, there are some challenges. Um, the challenge is that the once 
you need the platform for the information sharing. So there should be an institution organization that is going to make available that platform. So if there is no poor community system in place, then that might be a significant investment. And the second one is when you want to, let's say, share information across supply share partners or, or different agencies, the different agencies might be in different stages of IT integration or the integration of their platform might not be uh, easily achieved. So those are challenges that we need to take a look at it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, for that one. And Ben, I think naturally that goes to you. Rotterdam has been at the forefront of uh, various initiatives which relate to data, data sharing uh, at pilot stage and at production stage at the moment. I mean, what do you see as success stories there and indeed as challenges going forward? Kindly turn your microphone on. Thank you. For sharing data, we really need to have standards first, otherwise data sharing is, an, uh, is a fantasy. So we are very happy with the collaboration with the International Hydrographic Organization. If we want to share data about birth, terminal, deaths, etc., digitally, what non-technical standards do we have? So the data definitions, what technical standards do we have to exchange the data? Because all of that, believe it, or not, believe it or not, was not existing. So we are very happy with the International Hydrographic Organization to pick up the development of standards for nautical data. Likewise, for the International Maritime Organization, where we're working together closely with the facilitation committee to have an understanding how we can exchange data for administrative data, so notifications and declarations to authorities, but also operational data, which is often linked, so arrival times and departure times of ships, starting and completion times of services, how we can exchange this data. Again, also again, first agreeing on the non-technical standards, are we talking about the same definitions, and follow it up by collaboration with ISO, the International Standardization Organization, to have technical standards to exchange the data. So, uh, you know, as a port, uh, before we change our databases, before we change any uh, uh, fundamental systems, it's very important that we do this for, uh, right from the start. And having uh, the correct standards from both IHO and IMO. Thank you for the question. Interesting. And, um, Aguirre, if you allow me, can I just add something on that? Because uh, I've just seen there's a comment in the chat on whether IMO is looking to regulate just in time or not, and uh, whether there have been any plans. And so far, there's nothing been discussed on regulating just in time. There has been obviously a lot of focus over the last couple of years to develop the short term measure to improve the efficiency of ships and operation, which we hope is also going to serve as a driver from some of these measures that we have been showing here. But uh, I think following out on Ben, I think we have been doing together in the GIA a lot of work on in the GIA on addressing barriers. And I think what we have identified, because I think the, the person in the chat said the technology is there and it, it seems easy and straightforward, is that there are still major barriers that need to be overcome. And uh, some of them are data related, as Ben said, and there's a lot of work being going on at I, IHO and IMO under the facilitation committee as well to, to standardize uh, uh, data and data and, and enable data exchange. But I think there's also um, contractual barriers, for example, on just-in-time that need to be addressed because certain ship types uh, under certain, certain charter party agreements nowadays ships uh, cannot even adjust speed. So even if the master gets information on when to be at the pilot boarding place, the master would be in breach of contract if, uh, if, if he or she would reduce speed. So it's not just um, operational data related barriers, it's, it's also contractual that in the just in time need to be overcome and where more work needs to to take place. Just wanted to add that to, to Ben. 
Uh, and thank you, Astrid. It was one of the questions I was about uh, to ask you. Uh, so thank you for jumping in. Um, talking about data, but from another context, I mean, Rich, in the past we've been discussing uh, essentially how the, the, the port is a hub, you know, linking sea to land. And, you know, when, when you look at it from a congestion perspective or an, which also has, of course, environmental repercussions, what do your what do what do your studies say uh, in terms of uh, being able to forecast and manage, for example, what will happen on the shore side in relation to what is happening on, on the sea side? Yes, definitely. Thank you. So, so that's the challenge: is to understand what the connection or what the um, the opportunity to to understand a connection uh, between uh, waterfront activity and uh, vehicular or a roadway congestion. Um, I mean, as a port authority, we're, we obviously uh, look to the water and, and and we have a keen interest in in what's going on um, pier side and beyond. Uh, however, the vast majority of our operational decisions and the vast majority of the impacts here at the port are impacts that occur on the roadway itself. Um, so what we're looking to see is whether or not um, there's an opportunity to take data uh, such as um, uh, the data that's provided by marine traffic and look at that as part of a holistic system uh, to include um, data on our rail activity as well as data on our on our traffic uh, and over the road movement to understand um, where the connections are and you know it, it's difficult um, you know I draw the comparison to our airports the Port Authority operates airports in addition to seaports and for the airports it's a much more linear uh, connection. You know, they know at, at what time uh, daily aircraft are arriving and they know based on uh, previous, you know, data samples that the average passenger will will stay on terminal for 60 minutes while they collect their luggage and then they're able to co correlate or to predict when the the um, the activity at the at the at the curbside pickup will will likely increase because of the of the frequency of, of, of planes that are landing. It's it's much more difficult to predict that obviously here for ports because um, as a vessel comes in and it and it it, it exports or offloads a uh, a container, there's there's no real way for the port authority to know how long that that container is going to stay on terminal and when a truck is going to come to pick that container up. Um, so we have to we have to realize that there are differences um, in the industries, but I think that there is a real opportunity to to take a collective look at marine traffic data or um, waterside data as well as over the road data to understand where, where the correlation is. And then from a port authority's perspective or uh, from an operator's perspective, we can then make adjustments to our, to our daily uh, resource allocation to ensure that um, on days that we may be expecting a, a, higher, a higher volume of trucks, uh, we can allocate resources to, to ensure that that doesn't result in, in increased congestion either at the gates or on the roadways. Okay, it sounds like a, an extremely exciting analytics project. I'll tell you what, I mean, we'd love to talk more about that and can, can contribute into what you're doing. Um, I, am, I am also looking at the ticker of Q&A and, uh, and thank you very much, uh, dear audience, for, um, for putting those questions down. Uh, I, I do need to apologize in advance for not going through all of them. Uh, there's one here about incentives. Uh, and although it seems to be uh, addressed to Astrid and the IMO, maybe we can start from uh, Ricardo and your experience there. It says it's about incentivizing ports, for example, to, uh, to make changes and improvements uh, in order to empower vessels to perform better planning uh, and, and become, uh, for the port call to become more efficient. Um, I mean, what do you think? Is this uh, something that needs to come from a regulatory uh, authority such as the IMO? And does the IMO have, last read for you, perhaps later, does the IMO have authority over what ports do? Uh, and, but let's start with you there, uh, Ricardo. What, what's your opinion on that, incentives? Mm -hmm. Well, for uh, the incentive, um, well, as I said before, the, the main incentive for the port comes from from the community around the port, because uh, you will find that most of the ports are surrounded by cities. And then you have this port city ecosystem in which the port needs to contribute to the whole ecosystem around the port and the economic activity around the port. 
I would say that the main incentive uh, are coming from the community itself. No? And that's why you see most of the ports uh, committing to uh, emission reduction. And it's because the first beneficiary of that will be the nearby city. And that is probably the starting point. No? The, the second point would be when we talk about ports, we shouldn't forget that the port is not just um, the seaside. We need to remember that the port is the port is the node in which we switch transportation modes. We are switching from ocean to, to ground transportation. And then what we need there is uh, when we are talking about the incentive, the port needs to have also uh, a consideration of both sides. And that comes from the, in, to increase the efficiency of the whole operation, we need to have also just in time from the uh, water side, with also just in time with the, with the trucks, with the, with the rail movements, and then to have a very efficient operation. And probably the incentive would be in, in order to develop more um, poor community system or, or a digital ecosystem for the supply, for the maritime supply chain. I would see it more on that side. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. I mean, Tanya, we started with, you know, we opened up the discussion with incentives for, uh, from uh, Port of New York, uh, New Jersey, and you've got a mega city right next to, to you, you're serving there, the, the community. Do you feel pressure from the community as Ricardo mentioned? And, and you know, what kind of future incentives do you see actually uh, uh, being implemented? Um, yes, so we, we are surrounded by an urban area and um, we do see pressure from that and we, we basically do community outreach on that on, um, and we, we form, um, clean, we have a clean air strategy group where we meet regularly with, the, uh, with our community representatives and have discussions about um, what we're doing to resolve certain issues. Um, I think many of the issues um, that are raised by the um, neighboring communities are mainly um, concerning trucks and truck traffic and emissions from, you know, that are generated on, on, on land side, um, not necessarily at sea. I mean, there, you know, shore power every so often is raised, um, but um, mainly it's, it's, it's trucks. But um, we are proactive and um, work together with the community to try um, to come up with solutions. But it's also, you know, it's not, some, some of it would be solved, I guess, if you had a state actor that um, mandated certain regulations and then yeah. it'd be easier to enforce, but. I got that. I mean, Ben, how does it feel at, at your end there? And uh, Tanya has been mentioning short power twice. Maybe we should say that uh, under the, you know, it hasn't escaped the, the IMOs and GIAs. Uh, attention, there is a separate work stream on shore power. We didn't touch it much today. But Ben, I mean, how do you feel about incentives there for, and where, you know, how they are essentially put into practice? The incentives for, for us as a port, you mean to implement, implement these measures? Yeah, or indeed, you know, for, um, I mean, you know, is there a real reason why a port authority should, uh, I mean, why does the port authority of Rotterdam, for example, you know, choose to do these things? Uh, is it to keep your customers happy? Is it to keep the, you know, the city of Rotterdam and the neighboring urban area happy? Is it to keep your government happy? I mean, you know, uh, who drives these things and how do you incentivize then your customers to, to respond? Well, the largest, the largest incentive is, of course, to make our customers happy, the customers from uh, the shipping lines, because they will be happy if they can uh, have facilities in the port for hull and propeller cleaning, for example, or to repair their main engines. So it's a sort of the garage function of uh, a port. When it comes to uh, the terminals, together with the Port Authority, for example, to facilitate just-in-time arrivals, uh, that is more difficult 
because those emissions uh, will be uh, cut at uh, on the international waters and not in port waters. So what is the incentive for a terminal to help a ship to reduce emissions in international waters, which does not affect the local permit for the terminal for maximum emission levels or for the port authority maximum emission uh, levels. So that is more difficult. So there we see a sort of reason or a sort of need. How do we get a tap on the shoulder for terminals and ports to facilitate ships to reduce emissions in international waters? Interesting. A tap on the shoulder then. I mean, I don't know, Rich, how does that sound? <laughs> Would you welcome taps on the shoulder? Yeah, definitely. Um... You know, I think it's interesting, obviously, as a port authority, we want to be um, environmental stewards and we do care about the environment. So um, high level, you know, that's definitely an incentive or a driving uh, factor for us. But also just the just the realization that a that an efficient port uh, benefits all stakeholders. You know, I mean, you know, like to borrow the uh, the cliche, like a rising tide lifts all ships. And I think there needs to be a collective realization from the marine terminal operators, the port authorities, the shipping lines. As well as as well as the trucking industry, that uh, through shared data and through through a collective approach to some of these issues, we can we can increase efficiency at the port, which in turn will benefit everyone from from both a monetary as well as a productivity standpoint. Um, thank you, Rich. And maybe as as we're nearing, we've got three minutes as we're nearing the end of our webinar. And thank you very much for being here. Maybe a note of optimism. I mean, if you if you were to look into into the past 10 years and see the progress that has been achieved, right? Um, how would you foresee the future going forward uh, in terms of developments? Do you feel optimistic that uh, uh, new measures, these ones or others will take place and, um, and the situation will improve overall as far as the footprint, the environmental footprint of, of ports uh, uh, is concerned? I mean, let's start with uh, Ricardo. Well, I've seen that the future is brighter. Um, I've seen that the, now with the technology in place, we will be able to achieve things that were not possible before. Okay, thank you. That was nice, short and sweet. Astrid? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I'm, I'm also optimistic. I think there is uh, a, lot of, a lot happening in the industry. I've been with IMO now for almost 10 years and uh, the scale has been, it's been, it's just crazy to see how much is going on in the industry and both from shipping and port, port side. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. We are also having discussions in the GIA on these measures um, to see, you know, how, how can we support implementation of these measures? How can we maybe support creating incentive of these measures? And if I can just comment on that incentives versus regulations, I think we need both really. I think regulations uh, are obviously a key driver and we have a lot of port related port related regulations if you think about isps code fall port reception facilities there's a lot of regulations that refer to the port but i think in decarbonizing we will need both um, regulation and incentives but uh, yeah just to summarize i do think uh, it's a lot happening and i would encourage any port that is interested to work with us and collaborate with us to get in touch with uh, Aguirre's or Ben or me, um, as we are having dialogues with all ports on these measures and how they could be globally implemented. So thanks, Aguirre's. Thank you, Astrid. Maybe Ben? Yeah, I'm very positive. And uh, well, before the mindset was, why should we do this? And that mindset has changed to why don't we do this? So I'm very uh, optimistic and I see really a bright future together with Astrid that we will be able to implement measures that are hands-on and pragmatic and uh, together with very uh, enthusiastic report authorities. So, so far so good. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Rich, Rich and then Tanya. Yes, definitely, I, you know, you know I, I um, agree with everything that's been said. I think I am very optimistic. I think um, that the last year and a half with COVID-19 has, has really, um, has really um, pointed in the direction of technology and data to be able to solve problems and inform management decisions. So uh, I'm very hopeful moving forward that we will continue to leverage technology and data in that capacity. And, um, and, and I'm encouraged by what lies ahead.
Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Tanya? Um, I think I agree with everybody who has spoken before. Yes, I think there is a great deal of optimism currently. So hopefully we can maintain that and see some action. Amazing. I could say also from the side of our business, marine traffic, we are also overly optimistic about what can be achieved. And we see also great value in the data facilitating all sorts of thought leading uh, activities. Uh, so on that basis, um, yeah, the future is bright. Uh, let's go beyond uh, the reality of, uh, of past year, more or less. So I'm, I'm sure we will overcome all of these things quickly and get back to normality. I would like to thank you very, very much, uh, dear panelists, for uh, being here with us uh, and dear audience for uh, staying on and watching us for the past hour. Uh, we hope it's useful. We do apologize if your question has not been uh, answered. Uh, we will try to summarize it in a blog post uh, and we will also publish presentation and webinar recording. So thank you everybody. And for me, thank you very much and bye-bye. Thanks Thank you. a lot. Thanks, Aguirre and the Marine Traffic Team.